Good evening. Um, I'm David Dawson. I'm director of the Wiltshire Museum. Um, I forgot to press the record button at the start of the webinar with 60 on people. Um, so I'm, th this section is pre-recorded. Um, I'm going to be talking about the burial of the Master of Ceremonies, which has been in the news because of the musical instrument made from uh, a human femur. Uh, and that's been dated to a very specific period in the Bronze Age. So I'm going to be talking about the objects in a moment, but I'm just going to start off by talking about the, uh, the burial itself, which was close to Stonehenge. To start with, the, the location of the burial is really quite important. So this is uh, a screenshot of the wonderful Barrow map produced by uh, Simon Bantam. You see the URL up there, web.org.uk forward slash Barrow map. And what he's done is brought together data from a whole bunch of organisations, including the museum, to show you the position of um, barrows in the Stonehenge landscape. So Stonehenge, you can see, is just here. This is the A303, that well-known car park. Um, this is the Barrow Cemetery on Normanton Down um, with Bush Barrow, uh, one of the most important Bronze Age burial uh, in the Britain. Then when we come further south, we come to uh, the Wilsford Barrow Cemetery. And the barrow we're talking about is Wilsford G58. That's named after um, Leslie Grinsell, who uh, studied barrows in the 1930s and 40s and worked for the Ordnance Survey. Looking in a bit more detail, this is an aerial, uh, this, this again is from Google Maps, and shows the, the Wilsford Barrow Cemetery. But the one we're looking at is this one just here. Uh, with the dot in it. And you can see it's the, uh, the most westerly of this Barrow Cemetery. Now, on the, in the, on the landscape, this is what it looks like. You see the woods, and you can see here the Barrow, like so. It's rather hidden. Uh, Julian Richards has been um, Barrow bashing, getting rid of some of the scrub on these Barrows, um, but even so, this one is, is quite a, overgrown these days. And then in the top, this is the square hole that, uh, that William Cunnington dug. So essentially he was digging a square hole down from the top of the barrow, down in to, to reach the original uh, ground level. Um, and the, then, the interesting thing about the location though is the views because the Wilsford Barrow Cemetery is right on the top of the ridge. And this is the view south, and this is um, the south towards the Lake Barrow Cemetery. Um, not immediately obvious, but you can perhaps see there's some humps and bumps. There's about uh, 10, 15 barrows in this, uh, on the top of the ridge, looking down over the River Avon. The River Avon is off to our left, off to the east. And then if you look north from the barrow, that's what you see. Rather a fuzzy picture, I'm afraid but you can hopefully in the center, you can make out the stones of Stonehenge. And the ridge in between, um, the light colored ridge, that's Normanton Down. And you can see some of the Normanton Down barrows silhouetted against the, against the ridge. Now, clearly the location of the Barrow Cemeteries in the Stonehenge landscape is, is critically important. And it's cl they're clearly on the top of ridges so that you can see them. And the assumption has to be that people were living down in the bottom of the valleys near the water, near, the, um, near streams, and then could see their ancestors, uh, the barrows of their ancestors up on the top of the ridges. And quite often the barrows are on false, the false crests. So they appear to be on the top, even if the, the very highest bit is a few feet higher, a bit further, further, further back. But uh, I think that view of Stonehenge is really quite significant. And then our friend, Mr. Cunnington, this uh, recorded the excavations, and I use the word fairly loosely, and he talks about this large bell-shaped barrow, 121 feet in diameter, 11 feet high, considered the monarch of this group. So the most important, the biggest barrow in the cemetery. Um, at the time, he doesn't quite say so, but I suspect this was open uh, pasture, so he could really see um, the barrows in a way that we can't now, where they're uh, in woodland and superior size as well as its contents. So when he dug his shaft down on the floor of the barrow, we found the skeleton of a very tall and stout man. Interesting, those are the same words that he uses when he talks about um, Bush Barrow Chieftain. 
lying on his right side with his head towards the southeast. So, you, you know, if you, if you want to think about alignments, that's looking towards the, uh, the rising sun at, uh, at dawn in, what well, I guess, mid, midwinter, I suppose. And he talks about the finds, massive hammer of stone as the, uh, um, the battle axe and so on. Amongst which, and then the tube, enormous tusk of a wild boar, and amongst the numerous, numerous relics, spelt with a K, I rather like, the most curious article is one of twisted brass, whose ancient use I leave to my learned brother antiquaries to ascertain, as it's unlike anything we have yet discovered and fixed into a handle. Now, this wonderful watercolor done by uh, Philip Crocker shows what that looked like. And you can see there are some, some brass rings suspended from it, which we'll come back to. Um, so really quite, in, quite impressive. So now if I move and start talking about the objects in a bit more detail. So we'll start with the bottom row. As I say, I hope you don't feel too seasick now. Oops, and it would help if I stopped sharing. There we go. We'll start with the, the whetstone, which if I try and get the, uh, unfortunately the lighting the, the doesn't quite work on this. Um, you'll have to take a look next time you're in the museum. So this is a, an, essentially an, um, an oblong piece of stone with a, a horizontal groove, a sort of rounded groove through it. It was called a whetstone, which implies that it was used for um, sharpening uh, stone. This, uh, the, um, we've had some researchers in looking at all of our objects, thinking about the, the way they might have been used as metalworking tools. And we don't know the result yet, but they certainly were scratching their heads and wondering whether this was actually a metalworking tool. When you come across the boar's tusk, which really is enormous. Um, and it's worth remembering that um, boar's tusk, I'm pretty sure, were used for um, pressure flaking of flint. And they were certainly also used in uh, some types of metalworking. So again, we might be looking at bits of a toolkit here. And then across to the ax, um, it's very small. So it's what, um, four inches long, uh, sort of an inch broad, an inch and a half across. Um, and it's uh, flanged axe, so this is quite early. And, uh, you know, this, this is really well, you know, it's a really nicely made axe. There are only two axes found in burials in the Stonehenge landscape. This is one, the other is of course, uh, bush barrow. And the, clearly there's something going on there. And then if we go up, this is a bone handle with two rivet holes. Now, often this has been, um, the, the ax was actually placed in this as though this was a handle for the ax and it was sort of used as a chisel or something like that. In reality, we, the, the two don't seem to go together. The, the microware inside the handle just doesn't support that. It, um, the scratches inside from the metal are all modern where it's been sort of pushed in. So the chances are that that was for something else. Now, quite what is anybody's guess, but with the lack of wear on the inside, the chances are that this is with something organic. So maybe, um, uh, well, actually, it takes us on to the next object, which is the bone headdress. So this is a, a piece of bone. The key thing is it had holes drilled in the top. Now, the suggestion by um, Anne Woodward is that this was used to hold feathers, a bit like uh, the first peoples in North America. You know, you think of feather headdresses. And this would have taken a number of feathers pushed into it. And you know, it's a really attractive idea. And that fits with the wear patterns that um, have been suggested. And so you go back to this bone handle and you wonder what was, what was in that. Was it something like... Um, uh, sort of a batch of feathers sort of bound together. And the other thing you think of is um, 
in some African cultures, they have fly whisks or, or um, actually ancient Egypt, which are set in handles and you know, there's some sort of something going on there. So could it be something like that? This is where you just, it's really just, just guesswork. The battle axe is very fine, beautifully worked. And this is a green stone from Cornwall. Um, so this has moved you know, a good distance. And as a green stone, of course, it's incredibly hard, but it's, the, the way it's made is absolutely fabulous. Um, the other thing that's of note is that the, the hole that goes through it is straight-sided. And um, I'm told that what that suggests is that the hole was bored using uh, an animal bone and then a bow drill. So um, if you know, remember how um, uh, you start a fire with a bow drill, so a, a small bow, turn it through 90 degrees, wrap a bit of wood through it and rock it backwards and forwards. Um, the bow drill with a bit of sand is how you would drill the hole. Um, again, Katie Whitaker, who's done a lot more exp about experimental archeology span than I ever have, she may be able to, to confirm that later. Um, so absolutely fabulous battle axe. And you know, that really is a prestige item. That this was, you know, this wouldn't, although <laughs> it wouldn't do your head a lot of good, um, these are almost certainly um, ceremonial rather than practical. And it's worth remembering that in the Bronze Age, there's very little evidence of violent death. You know, you've got battle axes and daggers and things like that, but there's very little evidence of people having their heads caved in or um, uh, sort of nicks in, in between the ribs where, where a dagger had gone in. So I think it's rather than seeing these, just as well as seeing these as weapons, these are status symbols. You know, this is like having a Ferrari. And if we move on, the object that the, um, the research was about, the announcement was about, of course, is the musical instrument. So this is a human femur, but the end at the top has been cut off and then carefully shaped to make it into uh, the ma a mouthpiece for a musical instrument. The, um, we know from earlier drawings that there was a finger hole a, a, where it's broken off. The end, the, the bottom end is, that's a recent break. And the, um, the team um, at the University of Bristol, and uh, so that's Gina and Tom, got very excited about this because what their research was doing was looking at the way in which human remains were curated. Um, so that, in, in other words, how they were treated after death. And many of you will remember that uh, Mike Parker Pearson excavated a burial up in the, uh, the Hebrides where there was a body made of different component parts of, I think it's about four people, one of whom had been put in a, a bog, um, one of whom had been smoked in the roof, probably in the raft as a hut. So treated in very different ways, but then reassembled to make it essentially a Frankenstein-like uh, like burial. And so what uh, the team have been doing is looking at human remains, both within a burial, you know, where the, the body, and then where other bits of people have been buried with them. And it's worth remembering um, the Boscombe Bowmen, who of course are date to what, 2400 BC. What happened there was the same um, kist, essentially the same wooden coffin was reused for seven different burials. And when they put the, when each new burial was being made, essentially they shoved the bones of the previous one across to one side. But it's very common in Bronze Age burials for bits to be missing. And the suggestion is, is that when you buried your great grandfather, you went back a few years later, and perhaps you took some memory of some bit of him or, or your grandma, great grandmother, you took a bit of them as a memorial. And the paper that they've written highlights that you find sometimes human remains, particularly in slightly later period, actually in houses, um, essentially in holes where, um, uh, post holes. So it's as though the ancestors or your, your, your ancestors are living alongside you in your new house. So they got very excited about this because this is um, one of the few Wessex series of burials that we have human remains for 
because when our friend William Cunnington did his excavations, he left the human remains in the barrows. And we've got three objects made from human remains. This is one, and there are two um, Dagashi fittings as well. But um, with this, because of the state it's in, and because of the very small amount of bone they needed to do um, uh, radiocarbon dating, where they were able to drill the inside of it to get in a, a tiny sample, which was enough for radiocarbon dating. Now, this is where I have to use my crib sheet and tell you that the radiocarbon date was um, at 95% certainty between 1745 and 1617 BC. Now, that compares very well with the, the, the date that um, Anne Woodward and um, and other specialists had come up with for the burial. They were saying it's somewhere between 1700 and 1650 BC. Now, what that suggests then is that the musical instrument, the chap who it was made from, well, or chapess, we don't know if it's a male or female, the person it was made from was alive within living memory, at least, of the person who the musical instrument was buried with. So it might have been there. Um, it could have been a relative, so it could have been uh, a father, a mother, great uncle, great grandfather. But it's that sort of that sort of uh, nearness of kin. It's not as though it had been looked after, been curated for several hundred years. And this does seem to be a pattern from their article. This is what they're saying: is that generally, when human remains are being incorporated in in with another burial. Um, with these bits of people, it does tend to be within a generation or two of the people who are then being buried. So it's, and they argue very strongly, therefore, that what's going on is not an honouring of the, the, the deep ancestors, but these are people that they knew, they knew who they were. So, um, you know, it's, it's very close links. Now, the last object, which I haven't talked about, is the um, rather weird... Um, toasting fork, if you like. And you can see it's got two prongs. And at the top, the top left, there's rather sort of, it's a bit squiggly. Now, what that is, as Cunnington says, is there's a, a space for a wooden handle to go in there. And then there are those prongs. And then when Cunnington excavated it, there were three bronze links for, uh, with it. Now those still survive, but they don't, they're no longer attached. So they're hidden away in our stores. And Anne Woodward and co looked at them when they were looking at this, um, doing their research about 10 years ago now. Now you can see the sort of oblong slot and in the bottom corner, uh, oops, let me turn, turn it upright. In the bottom corner, you might be able to see that slot is narrower. That's because it's been worn away by those bronze rings. Now, what that means is that the prongs were, that this was held in the left hand at a slight angle because of the wear pattern, shows exactly how it's held. And this was not something used you know, every now and again, this was used a lot. Now, the suggestion is that it's a ceremonial cattle prod. So um, you'll be familiar that many, um, cultures, they measure wealth in terms of the number of cattle you have. So if here we've got the big cheese and he's got this ceremonial cattle prod because he is in charge of a herd of, you know, he's got a thousand cattle, let's say. And this is a symbol of that authority, which is quite interesting. And you compare that with the, um, one of the female burials, I'm just going across to the lady from across the sea. Um, and many of you would be familiar with the, um, the pendant in the shape of, shape of cattle horns. So this seems to be something, a similar sort of thing going on. And as Cunnington says, you know, there's nothing else like this. And in fact, there's, it goes for nearly all these Bronze Age things. There's nothing like any of them. The other thing that's really interesting about this is that as a te in technical terms, it is bonkers. If you're going to make um, a, you know, a cattle prod, this is perfectly fine, but can you see that the prongs are twisted? Now, we're, you know, we're all familiar with um, twisted iron um, fence posts sort of thing, 
um, fences, you know, you would be very, railings, that's the word. We're all very familiar seeing twisted iron railings. Now in iron, that's very straightforward. But with bronze, bronze is quite brittle. And that actually is a very difficult thing to do. And this is the only example that I know of, uh, of Bronze Age metalwork, where something bronze has been twisted in this way. And we've got this sort of thing in, with other objects in the, in the gallery. So we've got a, um, a pin with two, with two circular sort of rings at the head and two rings hanging off that. Now today, what we do is solder those rings. What they did was cast the whole thing in one piece, which is bonkers. It's just not a sensible way to make it. But what this is showing is what they were doing is sort of pushing their knowledge of technology to the boundaries. They knew what they wanted to, have to create and they were using the technology they understood in order to be able to do it, even if it didn't make sense. And that sort of tells you something about the experimentation that was going on at this period. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. So the, the amazing thing about the research really coming back is that is just understanding much more about the way that human remains were used in the Bronze Age and that worldview of the ancestors, that the ancestors weren't from deep time, but they were people that we understood, that uh, were known and understood. Um, and it's, you know, this potentially was a way of the ancestors always being with you. The other option, of course, is that this was a bit of, you know, an enemy defeated in battle or something like that, um, that rather than making your, grand, your granddad into a, um, a musical instrument, into a horn or a trumpet, you did that to one of your, your enemies. Um, but of course, we'll, we won't know. The reason we won't know is that although we can, although Tom Booth could have got the DNA, um, unfortunately, or William Cunnington didn't keep the human remains from the burial. So the chap, the master of ceremonies himself, his, his bones are still in the barrow. So the only way of working out the relationship would be to re-excavate the barrow, find the bones and do DNA analysis. So technically that's possible. Um, in reality, World Heritage Site, that's not going to happen. But we do, I do know of some really interesting DNA cover evidence coming out about relate, family relationships in the area around Stonehenge that um, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but will be out before long. So, you know, the linking of DNA certainly is possible. It's going to be a really interesting um, area of research in the future. Right, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Um, I'm happy to um, try and answer any questions. Um, I've not been looking at the chat, so I'm not sure if anyone used the chat to ask questions. Um, but if you would like to, if you want to ask a question, if you unmute yourself, and bearing in mind we've got 62 people with us, um, try, uh, I just ask everybody not to shout all at once. Thank you. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? David, David, it's uh, to Tom Massey here. I don't know if you, can you hear me? I can hear you, yep. Good. A, a, a point really about the boar's tusk, which is interesting because in the, the September issue of Geographical magazine, I don't know if you can, can you see my image? I, um, well, there are, you can no, see it in the small one, that's correct. Uh, there is an article about the Naga tribe of Northwest uh, Myanmar, which was Burma, and there's a photograph of a current uh, Naga hunter wearing a hat decorated with boar's tusks. Mm. I don't know if you can see that. So his, uh, his deer skin hat, but with boar's tusk mm. as presumably showing his prowess at oh hunting. God. So it's yeah. possible that uh, in this burial, the boar's tusk was used in that uh, way or not. Mm. Um, well, there's only one. <laughs> uh, <true>. Yes. <laughs> so there's no evidence of a suspension, you know, hold for suspension, but it could have been. Interestingly, the, um, the Upton Lovell Shaman so I'll point, point you at, uh, at him, um, if you can see him. So he has loads of bones and they're reconstructed as being, um, Cunnington says they were around his neck. 
and along the bottom of his cloak. But another reconstruction actually has them all over the cloak. Yes. And certainly there are people in, uh, I think, again, it's first peoples in North, Af North America who have bones all over a cloak. Again, as you say, to show your prowess in hunting. Um, and we've got the question from, uh, where are we? Melanie, why does the big cheese have to be a man? Um, that's a good one. The, the, the reason I say he's a man is because that's what Cunnington says. He said he's a stout and tall man. Now, the, the, the dodgy bit, of course, is that we don't have the human remains. And William Cunnington was in no way um, sort of medically trained and osteoarchaeologist. Um, osteo but he does say he was tall and stout, which does suggest, you know, quite big. And by, this, by the time he dug this up, he had dug probably 100 plus barrows. So he will have had an idea. Um, but very much he was a product of his time. If it looked, that some, looked as though somebody had things that were, you know, daggers and things like that, automatically they were men. If they had trinkets, as he put it, clearly they were women. Now that is obviously complete nonsense. And I remember um, when um, there was the discovery of a burial at the, uh, the small henge to the south of Marsden, M Marden, the, you know, the, the other Wilsford, um, the burial. Oh no, it was also the, um, there was a burial in, uh, in Amesbury with amber beads. You know, even today, archeologists immediately assume that they were female. In fact, those burials were male. And we, there are definite examples of, of female burials with daggers. So um, the answer is going on what Cunnington says, but it's, uh, that doesn't mean it's true. Well, David. Yes, oh, Simon, thank you for the barrow map. Hope you, you don't mind me shamelessly ripping it off. No, the more the merrier. Uh, sorry I'm in the dark here, but uh, never mind that. You made a point about there only being two bronze axes in the barrows in the Stonehenge landscape. Yeah. And I confess I hadn't realised that. Well, but I've just I, gone I, hope I, I hope I'm right. I'm right. I was yeah. just waiting for you to tell me I was wrong, which no, wouldn't no, surprise me. Right. I've just done the search on the barrow map and there are only two records and they're both in the group with the um with the master of ceremonies the mm. other one is in the barrow a little further to the east of that yeah now, well I, then in which case i am wrong because then there's bush barrow uh, okay so there's three there's three yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, certainly they're unusual and they are unusual in bronze age burials i'm gonna have to change what i tell everybody on my tours now <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for that. I'm glad, I'm glad you learned something. <laughs> Every day is a school day. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie says, thank you for your cheesy answer. Yes, quite. Okay. Any, any other questions? David, hi. 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 Sorry, David? Far yes, far away. Hi, Steve Marshall. Oh, hi, Steve. Oh, hi, Steve. Uh, Didn't uh, recognise you with the glasses. <laughs> uh, what, what I wanted to ask you is um, the, uh, the cattle prod thing, I think, is really interesting. Mm. Um, because the perch, pole, or rod, uh, as you know, is an ancient measure of 16 and a half feet. Uh, and it's supposed to have been a very ancient measure as well. And I wondered whether actually there was room inside the barrow for a 16 and a half foot pole and where the piece of... Um, metal went in relation to that. Was there a plan ever drawn of it? No, Cunnington didn't do plans. Not, not of barrows, not of the, the fines. It was quite annoying, wasn't he? Didn't it? didn't do that. <laughs> no. no. Um, it's 100, he said it's 121 feet across. So the answer right. is yes, there would be. Right. Which reminds me, there's, a, there's another barrow. I think it's the Sun Barrow, which is the one that's on the solstice line. Um, Cunnington talks about there being holes through the chalk of the barrow, which he said was where there had been a tree. So a tree had been buried within the barrow and right. some of the branches would have been sticking out, right. which I think is really, really interesting. So yeah. the, the answer is, well, it, it may have been. It could have been a 16 and a half foot long tree that yeah. they buried within. Yeah. But William Cunnington's excavation techniques were little short of grave robbing. 
Yeah. The only thing that rescues him from that is that he, uh, you know, he did record in some vague way what he found and kept the objects and made sure that we can relate the objects to the barrow. Yeah. You know, this it's is what, 1804, if I remember rightly, you know, this, this really yeah. is the, the dawn of archaeology. Yeah, I found one reference to a wooden bull roarer. Found some near Avery, and it was put in the museum. And a few years later, it turned to dust. Yeah, <laughs> quite. Sure. Mm. Anyway, thanks very much, David. Good to see you. Well, thanks. Any, anyone else? You can use chat as well if you want. Just wanting to say, it just seems to work remarkably well, Ian Craven. Um, oh, hi, Ian. Thank you very much indeed, David. It seems to work remarkably well as a tool for short updates. How fantastic. Uh, we don't have to feel quite so distant. Very good. <laughs> well, with only being able to fit 20 people in the lecture room, I think this is the only way to go. What, what we're thinking of doing is, is trying to sort of mix and match. So some people might be able to be, be the 20 in the room, but then find ways, you know, use this technology to, um, to make it, uh, to, um, you know, get a wider audience. We should be able, we should be able to do that. Um, if we get this Arts Council bid, I've certainly put in some, for some money for some decent kit because I'm running this off a webcam that cost me 30 quid and uh, the microphone is one that uh, came free with my mobile. So I'm sure there's stuff we can do to make this, this better and also the webinar version makes the whole process much smoother um, and I can get some practice in on that. And the other thing I know we we'll, would we'll need to do is um, have a DJ because trying to so talk, think, yeah. do the technology, you know, I'm a man, I'm, I, can only, I can only do one thing at a time. So, you know, that's what we will be aiming to, to do to, you know, make, make it better than it is at the moment. Well, it works as this and anything that makes it better will be good. Oh, okay. good. Glad to hear. If you give that, uh, that feedback on your, your form, that would be fabulous. Certainly will. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, anyone else? Or has everyone got a large glass of wine that they've got an appointment with, like I have? David, there's one more question in the chat. Oh, which I didn't spot that. Oh, um, about you, the finger holes. does the bone instrument have any finger holes is the question. Thank you. Sorry, th this is where I need the DJ, or, or Sarah's being the DJ. Um, there's, there's traces of one. So yes, there were finger holes, but we don't know how many and the rest of it has just disappeared. So um, whether, it was, you know, whether it was damaged before it went in, we don't know. But actually the, um, the wear analysis that uh, Anne, Anne um, Woodward did suggested that this was not much used when it went into the grave. You know, this wasn't something to be kicking around and being used a lot. This was in quite good nick. So the chances are it's got, um, you know, there's, <laughs> Knowing, knowing the way that Cunnington did his excavations, you know, there's no reason he shouldn't, that uh, somebody shouldn't, the, the chances are that somebody will have put a spade through it or something like that. So they weren't exactly um, careful excavators. Hey um, do we have any idea what kind of sound the instrument made? Is it uh, wind, you know, is it like a recorder sound or is it something much more harsh? I'll tell you what, if you'd like to give me your femur, you can have a go. <laughs> but we don't know whether, do we, do we know whether it's just blown or was something put into the mouthpiece to it's vibrate? The, the, the end of it, um, actually, I, I, let me see if I've got the, the slide. Um, yes, here we go. Ooh, someone's got a good, good clock. Ah. I'll get there in a minute. There we go. Um, <laughs> you may be able to see on the right hand side, for me it's covered on, up by um, the gallery, sort of speakers or people, but you might be able to see it's quite, it's smooth. It's been smooth, so it's not, there's no space to put a reed in or anything like that. It's smooth. It's as though, like the mouthpiece of a trumpet or a trombone. Um, there are uh, 
sort of I think they're called flutes made by of human bone by um, in that are made by people in Tibet if I remember rightly so a bit more obvious here I'll just zoom in because we can can you see yeah yeah, indeed. So, you know, it's very smooth. It's not, there's no space for a reed to go in or anything like that. So, you know, you blow a raspberry in it just like you do a trumpet. Not that I've ever played one, but I'm told that's what you do. Mm. And on this, you can see, again, you can see quite clearly the break, the breakages of this bottom end. You know, th those are not great. The hole, I think, is there on the, the top end. There's just a slight trace of it. There's enough to show there was a finger hole. The interesting thing though is that it's not the kind of um, mouthpiece you'd have on a woodwind instrument is it? It's much more like the kind of mouthpiece in a way that you'd have on a brass instrument. You know, yeah, something. absolutely. Yeah, that's why I try and call it a, a horn or a trumpet. Now trumpet, you know, you think coils and valves and so on, but horn mm -hmm. doesn't really get it. So, you know, you, the, the press or, you know, use the word whistle, which it certainly isn't. Uh, it's something more sophisticated than that. Yeah, oh, somebody in Clerking has said a didgeridoo. Oh, and Simon, a, a didgeridoo. Yeah, yeah. It's much, um, that's, yeah, good, good example. I remember that one. Thanks. Can I suggest it could also just hang and the wind blow through it like a wind chime? Hmm. Mm. Okay, pass. <laughs> Have to find a resident musical expert, expert, which I certainly am not. I, I'm not sure what, what, yeah. I suppose, yeah, sort of blowing over the top. Well, it could be. Would you have finger holes though? You don't know it's a finger hole. Yeah. You just know that it's a hole. Well, there's a hole. Which yeah. can be used to hang. Oh, true, true, okay. Yep, jumping to conclusions, quite right. Hopefully, we should ask our, our resident musical expert, having seen Steve just about to try and say something. Uh, yeah, technically it's a trumpet, and a didgeridoo is a type of trumpet. If it's played by vibrating your lips, then it makes it a trumpet. Oh, really? If you blow, if you blow across the end of the pipe, or across a notch on the pipe, um, then it's a flute. But this is definitely a trumpet. It's a mostly. trumpet, right. Yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> I've learned something. Thank you. <laughs> Two things. I've got a question about the handle. Yeah. Well, I wonder whether there's any possibility of looking for feather DNA inside it. Blimey. <laughs> Just well, a there's a thought. <laughs> okay, it's possible. Yeah. So you can try that on Tom, Tom Boo next, next time he's in. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. Uh, David. Yeah. I was wondering um, if the, I was under the, the impression that the, the axe was found in the handle. If the axe wasn't found in the handle, what caused the differential um, patination on it? Because you've got the, the hand, the, the sort of the half mm -hmm. end of the axe is still quite, it's still got quite a nice sort of um, bronze sheen, whereas the other side's clearly been more sort of oxidised. Yeah. Um, well, Cunnington doesn't se talks about them being separate, and his his illustration doesn't show them together as I think he could have done. Um, as I say, Anne, Anne Woodward, when she looked at the, the wear analysis, and you'll correct me because you've been reading it more recently than I have. There wasn't, a, you know, the, the, the wear inside the handle wasn't right. Um, the, the differential you get that on the bush barrow axe as well, and that's probably where the wood of the handle was before it rotted, so when it was, when it was rotting away in the grave. And, um, and, and, and at this point, I'm now making it up, if you hadn't noticed, um, mm -hmm. is the, the handle, the, 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 the ax would have been, I'm sure there would have been an, uh, an adhesive gum of some sort, which would have had an effect on the, the metal surface as the wood was rotting away. So I think it's the decomposition of the wooden handle Okay, cheers. Does that sound convincing? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I'm clearly going to I'm clearly gonna have to edit that modes record. <laughs> Sorry, Will's working on, um, we've got a, a Arts Council project, funded project to take the 
get all the research that's been done on our collections over the last 10, 15 years or so, and get it into our collections database, because it's a huge task, as Will will um, agree. And all this stuff has been going on, you know, and you know, the modes record and the, the record online for that just said bone tube. And whereas there's this huge story about what it is and its significance, which just wasn't there. So that's uh, Will's working on picking all sorts of bits of uh, research and shoving them into our database. And then in due course, we'll be doing an updated version. Um, we will be doing that regularly apart from this, uh, the, the pandemic, which means, Will, you've been in the museum once, I think, since uh, lockdown. So we've got to do a whole sort of data conversion routine and things like that and get it uploaded. Can we? No. I'm not on video. There's a picture of me. Right. Oh, okay. Any, anyone else? Some things are interesting. <laughs> okay. In that case, I think I'll say goodbye. I'll hang, I'll hang on while people disappear, but uh, thank you very much for coming. And just to, to remind you, I'm, I'm afraid you're gonna be getting a, an email questionnaire wing its way into your inbox and be really grateful for your feedback. So thanks for coming. Apologies for having had to postpone the events, but hopefully you know, we can use this technology to take them online and uh, bring you an interesting set of talks uh, in the months ahead. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.